Hello, Karina. Hello. Welcome to our session. We are going to start uh, in two minutes, but before to start, we are going to take a picture, okay? And see our beautiful faces out there on the website later on. <laughs> So everyone is here. Right now, Please. we only have 16 people in the room. I take one shot now, and then later on, if we have some more people joining, then it would be nice to have one more shot with other people. But if not, okay. then we can just start the session. Thank you very much. OK, so, so, so you are going to take a picture, right? Yes, I did already. But right okay. now, we only have. <laughs> 16 people in the room because some are the other session before they haven't finished yet so i guess we might have some more people join afterward okay we still have one minute left um so can we pick a group photo during the maybe more people joining us? yeah yeah sure sure <laughs> How's it going, everyone? <laughs> Fine. Great. Good. Okay. Good. So maybe you can take a group photo at the end of the sessions. You know, expect yeah. more people to come to join yeah. our sessions. <laughs> yeah, I think it's better for sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. We can do one more before we finish. <laughs> if I get a good photo, we can we can send it to you, and we can use that. Uh, in okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, please monitor the number of people in attendance in today's. <laughs> okay. So yeah, for sure we will have a lot of people in the session. So we need yeah. just to wait. Okay, I see. I actually I think more than fifty people register for our 50? session. Wow, 50. that's 50. Amazing. Yeah, more than fifty. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's amazing. I expect more to join us okay so guys uh we can wait one more minute and then i uh, start the session okay um because yeah just one more minute meanwhile um Hadi uh, sent a uh, inbox uh survey if you if you can like participate in the survey it would be very nice yeah, I've just sent it again. It's a pre-event okay. survey. So. Okay, thank you. Yep. Mm. Let's start. Um, so welcome to our session. Yeah, um, the ECOP Asian perspective on science and knowledge communication. Uh, this is the incubator session number 17. Uh, and I'm Karina Higa. I'm ethnobiologist and educator. I belong to Women for Oceans and Ocean. And also I'm part of the Early Career Ocean Professional Program. I uh, especially, I work with ocean literacy at the international level. And I will be your moderator for today, for this session. So the main goal uh, of this session is uh, to learn a little bit more of um, how to communicate effectively when we talk about ocean for different publics. Uh, communication is very crucial um, because uh, if you cannot communicate well, people will not understand us. And it's very hard to get collaboration if people don't understand us. So, that's why communication is really important. And uh, hope uh, we can um, help you uh, giving some tips uh, about communication. And um, who organized this session, uh, this workshop was uh, Early Career Ocean Professional in Asia, which is uh, called ECOP Asia. And I would like to introduce, uh, to call uh, Dr. Yushi Morioka from Jumpstick in Japan to explain a little bit of uh, what, what is ECOP Asia? <laughs> and the floor is yours, Morioka san Okay, so uh, may I share my screen first? Is it okay? 
Sure. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen first. And can you see my presentations? Yep. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to reintroduce our, you know, ICOP Asian Networks a little bit, you know. Okay, so my name is Yushi Moriokas. I'm a researcher in JAMSTEC in Japan, but now I'm a, a visiting research scholars at NOAA GFDU in Princeton, the US. So I'm very, I'm very happy and a great honor to join today's session and introduce our activities. And now in the US, the local time is 3.30 a.m. So I'm a little bit sleepy, but I hope I can stay awake during today's session. And also I really welcome your great questions and also some suggestions about our activities. And as you know, the oceans are Play the fundamental roles in our Asian you know, societies and economic activities. Uh, here, for example, like uh, population size in Asia is like 4.6 billion, which consists of the more than 50% of the total uh, global populations. And also nominal GDP in Asia is around $29 trillion, which explains more than 30% of the total global you know, GDPs. And also our economies, societies are highly dependent on the marine resources through the fishery, shipping, tourism industries. However, uh, due to the natural variability and also human stresses such as climate change, variability, marine pollution, and also overfishing processes, uh, marine environment in the uh, ocean surrounding ages have deteriorated recently. So to address the, these marine issues in the global and also regional scales, uh, United Nations has proclaimed a uh, decade of the ocean science for sustainable development for the next 20 years after 2021. So here is a list of the seven ocean goals built up by the United Nations and also IOC Westpac has coordinated the United Nations preparatory processes and invited the global ocean community to join this program. And so now uh, we are trying to promote the additional uh, unit decade programs for the, you know, for the ocean we want, for the future we need. And here is, uh, under the, this UN decade program, uh, there is a global communities for the early ocean, early, early career ocean professionals called ECOPS, who has a professional experiences with less than 10 years. And these eco programs consist of the five tax teams, youth engagement, ocean literacy, corporate sustainability, monitoring training, and network networks. And one of my colleagues in Japan, Karina Sandy, and myself to involved in one of the, these task teams. And also we recently established the uh, eco Asian networks consisting of the eight countries and now trying to connect existing eco networks in Asia through activities. So here is an example of the recent activities of our ECOP Asia in 2020s. And in this year's June, uh, we co has contributed to the global ECOP days event in which we exchange the recent activities and best practices experiences on uh, related to ocean science and technologies. Since then, our ECOP Asia network is gradually expanding across region and countries. For example, one of the speakers, Nanda's probably introduced uh, their national eco uh, networks in India. And also even in the Southeast Asia, recently eco, uh, eco organized the ocean governance workshops in the Southeast Asia. And also today uh, we have the first you know, um, sessions on the science communications under the, this West Park, Park kickoff conferences led by the Harris Fishers. So quick, to quickly summarize our ECOP activities, uh, ECOP Asia is a regional networks uh, under development for the early career ocean professionals who had the professional experiences with less than 10 years. And also ECOP Asia has played a great, great roles in developing the national network of Asian ECOPs across the disciplines and also share knowledge and experiences about oceans. And also we are, are planning to organize the, uh, this kind of an online seminar workshop symposium on national to global levels. Uh, and also uh, we are now trying to launch our eco program website to share our recent activity and also past experiences uh, 
or among the uh, ECOP people, ECOP Asians. And also, if you're interested in our ECOP Asia activities, uh, we really uh, welcome you to join our network and also contact us at this email address. Okay, thank you so much so the, uh, for the kind of listening. Thank you, Maria. Um, so to explain a little bit of one of activities uh, we had this year, uh, I would like to invite Lin Wang from Institute of Oceanology uh, at the Chinese Academy of Science um, to explain a little bit of the, the review past survey that we carry out at the VCOP day. The floor is yours. Thank you, Karina. Uh, I'll share my screen. Can you see my slide? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Lin Wang from China, and uh, welcome to join our Incubator 17, um, organized by the ACOP Asia. And uh, I, I think uh, Morocco already uh, introduced what is ECOP Asia and uh, about the global eco program. And uh, I will talk about the challenges and opportunities of eco Asia. And uh, I will start uh, from introduce a little bit about more about the eco program of the UN Ocean Decade. Actually, um, the early career ocean professionals eco program is an endorsed program of the UN Ocean Decade acting as an enabling network program. It aims to empower ECOPs with meaningful networking and professional development opportunities under the framework of the UN Ocean Decade. And it starts from this year uh, and to 2030. And the role of ECOPs in the uh, UN Decade is Actually, in the implementation plan, it said that ECOP will be central to the success of the ocean decade. And uh, what can ECOPs do for the decade? Actually, I cited this from the global ECOP program. Uh, firstly, to elevate and strengthen the diverse perspectives of new generations uh, in a collective voice. Secondly, to ensure the knowledge is transferred between experiences and early career ocean professionals. And thirdly, to promote ocean sustainability for the ocean we want. And uh, as Morocco already introduced, we had a We ECOP Day uh, in June this year. And it was a 24 hour live stream event and uh, hosted by the ECOPs from around the world and the, from a variety of ocean disciplines. And the uh, ECOP Asia also hosted one meeting during the time slot five. And uh, if some of you joined our event that time, I think you already familiar with ECOP Asia. And uh, during the We ECOP Day, uh, the global ECOP program conducted one survey, global survey, uh, to identify what the, uh, what the ECOPs uh, need and what the ECOPs want uh, for the UN decade. Uh, and uh, they received more than 1,000 responses. Um, this is uh, the results of the global survey. And uh, from the survey results, and what do ECOPs want uh, from the, actually it's uh, first, uh, the most, the most uh, the ECOPs want is uh, funding and also the information on how they can participate in the UN decade and more job opportunities and uh, communities, etc. cetera. And uh, we also conducted uh, ECOP Asia survey during the We ECOP day. And this is a questionnaire uh, we applied. And uh, the ECOP Asia 
from the Eco Asia survey, uh, we received nearly 180 uh, re responses. And uh, we can see from this chart that uh, most ECOPs uh, they interested in predicted and uh, productive and healthy ocean. And uh, most of them, uh, more than 70% uh, from the science communities. And uh, we can, I compare the global survey to Asia survey that uh, we can see that uh, the responses received from the global survey, uh, most of the people from the, from the, uh, from the actually professionals with no more than three years uh, since they got their professional degree. And from, uh, from ECOP Asia survey, uh, many, most of the ECOP Asians, they are from the actually more than professionals with more than four years uh, after they got their professional degree. And uh, about the gender, we can see that uh, <laughs> it's interesting because uh, from the Google questionnaire, uh, more male professionals uh, joined to fit, join the feedback and uh, from the Slido, oh, I'm sorry, uh, more female professionals actually give their feedback. And uh, about the aware awareness of the UN decade of ocean science, uh, more than, I think most of the ACOPs who did that study, or they already, know about the ocean decade and uh, what kind of communities and network information do they need? Uh, many people said that uh, more collaboration and funding and also make people more aware of the importance of oceans and uh, share information, more trainings, workshops, and more research at more research activities. So from the survey results, we can see the challenges. Uh, we feel that um, most is the funding and career opportunities. Also community and networking also uh, is a very important part. And, also, uh, and we can see that uh, during this, uh, in this region, we have uh, we have also um, language barrier compared to the global survey because uh, most of the countries in this region uh, they are not use English as their native uh, language. So, but we need to communicate in English. So this is a huge barrier in some in some way. So opportunities uh, we can see that. Uh, we can, uh, such as regional eco community in, in Asia, such as eco Asia, uh, maybe as an opportunity to connect the ECOPs in this region and develop the collaboration and also international networks with projects in common and the uh, network with routine annual meeting uh, also is useful for us to engage more ECOPs. And uh, um, can you see? Yeah. Can you see? Okay. Uh, and so, so I also find that uh, next, uh, the, the opportunities for our to develop in the uh, ECOP Asia group, I think uh, firstly, we can identify what we can do together and uh, because we are from the different, uh, we are from different communities, uh, including research, uh, science, science, science community policy, industry, and ocean literacy. And we, I think, we if we want to develop the uh, ECOP activities in this area, I, uh, it's more important to identify what we can do together, and also to mobilize financial resources. Uh, 
and then to mainstream the role of ACOP to developing in developing science-based solutions to, uh, to develop a sustainable ocean, and also contribute efforts that can help raise awareness and share information. Uh, okay, that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ling Sun. Uh, it's very important to know all the gaps uh, that we have in this region to, to address that uh, under the UN Ocean Decade. Thank you very much for all information. And uh, just to remind you um, that uh, this meeting will be recorded uh, and the recording is going to be posted on the conferences, uh, conference website. Uh, if you have any question, please use the Q&A uh, the, the chat box uh, to ask questions for the speakers. Okay. Um, uh, just uh, to explain a little bit uh, of um, the, uh, sorry, I'm a little bit lost here. So um, Hadi, uh, Hadi sent um, a link for you guys that is called Ocean Decade Global Stakeholders Forum. Uh, this is um, kind of uh, linking um, for UN Ocean Decade, and we encourage we encourage everyone to sign up and to join this platform because there is so much opportunity. You can um, find people in your region to collaborate with. You can find uh, job opportunities or uh, funding opportunities in in this uh, in this platform. So we we strongly uh, encourage you to join that. Now I would like to call uh, Dr. Hari Vishi. Uh, from National University of Singapore um, to talk more about the online survey on science communication than we plan for this session. Hari, it's your turn. <laughs> Thank you, Karina. Uh, let me quickly share it. So I promise I won't take much time. It's uh, essentially just for the survey, which the link I have already sent. So. Uh, Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. My name is Hari Vishnu. I'm also one of the co-conveners of this session. Uh, I'll be your chat moderator for today. I'm from the National University of Singapore Acoustic Research Laboratory, and I also represent the IEEE Oceanic Engineering Society, uh, and I'm also chief editor of Energine magazine. So uh, Lin Wangsang already gave you a review of a survey we had taken earlier this year where we wanted to gauge what kind of audience we have and what they are looking for broadly from the ocean decade. Um, and as you saw, a lot of the comments were for funding, which uh, I think we can all relate to given if we are from this region, funding and uh, opportunities. There were also some uh, requests for, th there were also some, there was a wish list for training and there was a mention of a language barrier. So communication does play an important part. And, Networking was one of the biggest, uh, I think the second or third biggest uh, things that aims were pe that people wanted to fill up this decade. So all this combined, I think science communication uh, plays a big part in all of this. So moving in, we want to know what you would like specifically in terms of science communication to gauge what it is that you want to take away from this session. And that is why we have this. Uh, so I have already sent this link in the chat. Please find the link in the chat, or if you can't do that, you can uh, uh, use this link. Please provide your response on the survey so that we understand what uh, your interests are and it'll help us guide uh, the session as we go along or even future workshops. Uh, broadly speaking, we want to gauge uh, the audience and generally what we want to take away, get an idea of requirements for our attendees and plan future similar workshops. Uh, yeah, so I think we'll give the audience two minutes. It's just a two minute survey, two to three minutes survey. We can give the audience two minutes to fill up the survey uh, while we, uh, and we can wait for that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, let's let's give two minutes, uh, guys, for you. Uh, meanwhile, if any of you attended the high level, the, the kickoff session yesterday uh, early, you would have noticed there was another similar, uh, 
another similar survey done where they were asking what are the uh, sectors being represented so we saw that most of them were from research and academia but there was also heavy representation from governments and students so research academia student and government uh, was bulk of it but there were also a few from ngos intergovernmental organizations and business sectors and uh, when there was a survey on the aim of the uh, the attendees from this conference, it was to learn more about the ocean decade and ocean sciences development in this region. So people are still keen to understand more about uh, the ocean decade. Uh, but now people have started getting involved more in terms of developing network for future actions and to develop uh, joining the proposals itself. So I think uh, this workshop is a step in that direction. So that is just a recap of what we had yesterday, but I'll get back to our survey. Let's give it maybe a couple of minutes more and then we can start with our speakers. Sure. So the responses have started rolling in. Uh, I think we can do a quick review of how the responses look so far and then move on. If you already have uh, filled up the, um, opa, the survey, you can just uh, um, greeting, say, hi, I'm from uh, Japan. I'm from, yeah. So you can say, uh, say hello to us and say your name and your institution and where are you from on the chat box. Indeed. And in fact, we, yes. all, we are seeing a snapshot of that already. We have a wide variety of participation from Singapore, India, Korea, Brazil, Japan, a couple from Japan, we have from Malaysia, South Korea, Indonesia, Philippines. So that's quite a bit of geogra geographic diversity, mostly from Asia, the responses so far, but I think people are still filling in. Uh, in terms of sector uh, of the attendees, I think, again, we have mostly representation from research, teaching and students, but we also have representation from government agencies. So that's good to have. And I think that adds some diversity to our discussion today. Uh, looking at uh, what level our audience is comfortable with the following aspects of science communication. Uh, in terms of social media, I think we have people from around the, uh, from all sorts of uh, situations. So we have people who are less comfortable all the way until people who are more comfortable. So it's fi fairly evenly divided there. In terms of communicating with students, I think most people are very comfortable and some are somewhat comfortable. And I think that uh, reflects the fact that our audience are generally from academia or students or even research. Uh, communicating with policymakers, it seems like a lot of people want to get some idea on this because about one third of the people say they are less comfortable communicating with policymakers. And uh, we do have a couple of talks uh, addressing that. So that's good to know. We also have a few who are neutral. So again, some room for some improvement there. There are a few who say they are, uh, they are comfortable speaking with uh, policymakers. Uh, again, the, a similar situation communicating with industry and private sectors. We have one third people who say they are less comfortable, uh, one third who say, uh, 5% who say they are least comfortable and a large chunk who say they are neutral. So again, uh, some scope, I think for our attendees uh, who are looking to gain some insights there. In terms of communicating with academics, 75% say they are most comfortable. Uh, again, I think given our background and communicating with local public, there are people from around the spectrum. Uh, one, one fourth say they are most comfortable, but a large chunk are somewhat comfortable. There's one third who are either neutral or less comfortable. So that's good to know. Good. Uh, we have talks from uh, uh, trying to trying to address each of these gaps, talking to students, policymakers, public, uh, private sector, public sector, all of that. 
hope you take away uh, what you are looking for from this workshop. Uh, looking at what kind of science communication the attendees would like to develop during the ongoing decade, most of them say they want to look at communicating with policymakers and communicating with local public. And I think that's what we saw in the earlier uh, results too. A lot of them want to look at communicating with industry and private sector also, but a large chunk of them still want to look at communicating with students. So uh, I think people uh, are still looking to improve their communication and that's always a good thing. In terms of specific skills, uh, the, the uh, skills that I think most people are looking at is speaking. Uh, there's also interest in writing long format blogs or writing short format tweets or in designing graphics. And a smaller number of them want to look at making podcasts or videos. And finally, in terms of what social media channels that the attendees look out for information, I think most of them are looking at Twitter. Well, I relate to that. I look out on Twitter and Facebook too. But there are also uh, many who look on Instagram and LinkedIn and a few on uh, Slack and other channels. Uh, again, this is not a complete uh, report so far. Uh, I'm sure there are still more attendees filling up as we go along. So uh, probably the numbers will change by the end of it. Finally, uh, it seems most of our attendees prefer news digests for short bites, says up, up size, uh, updates of science. Uh, not surprising given the fast world we live in, but I think uh, many of them want to also look at Facebook posts and short highlight podcasts and a fewer number at LinkedIn posts. Uh, for long discussions, most of them prefer seminars and workshops. So here we all are at one of these workshops. Uh, many of them also look out for articles and blog posts, and it seems a fewer number for podcasts. So thank you all for uh, participating. And if you haven't participated, please uh, go and check out the link anytime when you find time during uh, a break or when you catch a breather. Uh, it helps us understand what you want and uh, probably improve and target our audience better in the future. Thank you. Uh, the floor is yours, Karina. Thank you very much, Hari. Uh, and now to start with our first speaker. Uh, first of all, if you have any question, please use the chat box. Um, and uh, to start with our first speaker, I would like to invite Dr. Nobuko Nakamura from Jonsei in Japan. So today uh, sh uh, she's going to talk about development of teaching, teaching materials using corals, annual rings in small islands in developing states. So welcome Nakamura-san and th uh, thank you for being here with us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Can they catch me? And yeah. I, yeah, I share yeah. my slide. Can you watch? Yes, I can see it. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Nobuko Nakamura. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak in this session. Uh, firstly, let me introduce myself. I've had three positions in my career, uh, science researcher, teacher, and ocean policy researcher. As a geoscience researcher, I worked on reconstructing past climate and environment using coral annual rings. I taught natural science in junior high school and high school, and now teach geology at university. In addition, for the past five years, I've looked at the field of ocean policy. When I studied climate change issues through coral research, I wanted to see how we could make a real change in society. In those three positions, I had contact with various stakeholders, including students, citizens, and government people, and experienced the role of science communicator. Today, I'd like to talk about two examples. The first, it's about the Ocean Education Support Program in Japan. The second is my activity in informing the local people and the children in Tuvalu 
of the scientific results of my local coral studies. First, I will introduce the Ocean Education Pioneer School Program, which supports ocean educational activity in Japanese school. This is a joint effort by three organizations, the Nippon Foundation, the Ocean Policy Research Institute, or PRI of Sasakawa Peace Foundation, and the Center for Ocean Literacy and Education, the University of Tokyo. I was a research fellow at OPRI until May, working on this project. There are not many opportunities to learn about the ocean as part of the curriculum in Japanese schools. This is why we are providing funding, funding for each school to develop a unique curriculum related to the ocean. The next example is my activity in informing the local people and the children in Tuvalu of the scientific results of my local coral studies. I have created a simple animation based on the study of coral annual rings and will show it to local communities and schools in Tuvalu. The goal of this activity is to make people aware of the reality of coral reefs on their own island and encourage them to think about the environment and climate change measures. This animation is based on the Tuvalu research project as one of Japan's ODA called the Satraps. From 2008 to 2014, the University of Tokyo group led this project called Ecological Engineering Sustainability of Tuvalu Against Sea Level Rise, and I joined it. Tuvalu in the South Pacific is a coral atoll country that is vulnerable to climate change, especially sea level rise and is often reported as a symbol of climate change crisis. On the other hand, many of our islands are suffering from severe local pollution as well as climate change, and their coral reef ecosystem are being degraded. The problem is a complex mix of global climate change and local pollution. During this project, Coral annual ring samples were bored in 2009. Small island developing states such as Tuvalu do not have long-term environmental, uh, environmental monitoring data. So geological samples such as coral rings are useful in understanding the timing and process of pollution and to reconstruct past coral reef environments. I continued the analysis of this coral core for a long time, and the scientific paper was published last year. The coral annual rings obtained from Fongafare Island, the capital of Tuvalu, covering the period 1940s to 2009, showed the very severe effects of human activity as black contaminants since 1990s. Waste and domestic sewage getting into the lagoon cause sludge and algae proliferation. Currently, the coral around this area has disappeared and has been replaced by a forest of large brown algae, a sargasso. The reef creatures like coral grover and foraminifera are island components. So the habitat degradation means reducing the resilience of the island against sea level rise. Uh, Tuvaluan people know the threat of global 
change, uh, climate change and celebrate rise, but they do not notice or forget that the domestic pollution also affects the island. The healthy coral reef environment is essential protection against coastal erosion and submergence. What is the best way to inform the people about the reality of the coral reef situation on their own island? Therefore, I'm creating an educational animation using the Tsubaru coral ring chronology. Coral annual rings are a visible time scale, which is an excellent educational material to effectively, effectively uh, teach them about the past. Uh, I created my handmade trial animation. I would like you to watch it. The target audience is Tuvaluan junior high school students and the general public. The most important point and the most difficult to communicate is to put difficult scientific technical terms in a simple and accurate way. Uh, communicate as a science, not as a political message. I believe it will reach people better that way. I'm currently having various people watch this and collecting their comments. The next step is to have people in Tuvalu actually see it. Through the Consul General of Tuvalu, I'm asking the Tuvalu ambassador and Tuvalu's Olympic Committee members involved in this summer's Tokyo Olympics and other key people in the region to help me. It would be great if I could get the local community and the school to take it up. And this will be a good start. I hope that this animation tool will encourage and lead to a discussion on the environment and the climate change measures at the citizen level in Tuvalu. Uh, thank you. And uh, if there is still time, uh, I'd like you to watch the animation. Uh, actually, we don't have time now, but <laughs> we can, uh, yeah, sorry, but we can send uh, the link um, of your animation. Okay. Is it in, on YouTube or not? Okay. Yeah, it's not a problem. So, but I would like to ask um, um, a short question, okay? Uh, could you uh, summarize um, uh, your communication uh, strategy in few words, like um, uh, how can you define uh, your strategy, communication strategy? In few words, yeah, in few words, like yeah. easy communication, yeah. what kind of way? So, uh, firstly, so in this session, I hope to say the for the scientists, the keeping a uh, wide, why do, why do broader perspective is the important is important to communicate. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I think it's very important uh, work to work with, with ocean literacy. Ocean literacy is the essential tool to change this decade. Thank you very much for your presentation and sorry no, because we do, don't have much time for your video. Thank you so, so much. So for, uh, for the next speaker, I would like to invite Dr. Hui Zhou um, from the Institute, Institute of Oceanology uh, at the Chinese Academic of Science in China um, uh, to explain a little bit of how to help youth to build an ocean dream, a practice of ocean literacy in China. The floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Share my screen first. Okay, um, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to give this talk and thanks for the invitation given by Dr. Lin Wang. 
Uh, I'm Hui Zhou from the Institute of Oceanology, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, and my background is physical oceanography. Uh, so my talk uh, includes these three parts. First is about the introduction of our institute. Um, our CAS uh, is the first uh, multidisciplinary research institute in marine science in China. And it was founded in 1950. And uh, it is located in Qingdao, a port city in East China. And our institute is also a key center for graduate education and training in marine science in China. And then I will uh, briefly introduce the ocean illiteracy in practice conducted by our uh, institute. Um, our CAS has quite rich ocean science education resources. For example, uh, we have coastal offshore deep ocean comprehensive research vessel fleet, um, which are in good conditions and uh, uh, with advanced uh, facilities, except uh, uh, the research vessel Kushio One, uh, which was decommissioned in 2015. And now it becomes a education center um, for young um, children in, uh, in Qingdao now. And uh, our CAS also has the biggest marine biological uh, biology uh, herbarium in China, uh, receiving over 5,000 visits each year from school students. And uh, we also have two exhibition halls for our CAS history and ocean big data presentation. Besides the on site visiting, um, sometimes uh, these two halls also held live and virtual tour, uh, which attracting over 200,000 people for each activity. And the most popular activities are those conducted on board our research vessel, Kuxue. Uh, our CAS has host, uh, hosted marine science camp on uh, risk vessel Kushio with China Association for Science and Technology each summer. Students can learn many marine technologies, including ship structures, ocean observational instruments, sailing, and uh, ship items on the cruise. Uh, in recent two years, uh, due to the COVID-19, sometimes on-site visits are available our CAS and the China Science and Technology Museum jointly hold the Marine Science City online courses. Students can watch um, some on-site ocean instrument operations um, on, from deep sea uh, crews on board of research vessel Kushi by attending live streaming classes. Um, both for the local students, they can attend the on-site experiment teaching classes on mobile laboratory in the ocean. Our CAS also uh, established a quite popular activities, uh, which is an open science day uh, for children in May uh, each year. And uh, meanwhile, uh, we also organize different, organize different lectures covering ocean physics, geology, and uh, biology in local primary schools. And the speakers are mostly young scientists in our institute. Um, as a major institute of ocean science in China, our CAS is the most popular institution that mainstream media wants to cooperate with for ocean science education programs, such as the Chinese Central Television. And uh, now there are four uh, popular programs, namely uh, the Kushia Research Vessel, a uh, modified treatment for red tide, the basic organics, and the description of jellyfish vernal. This pro 
uh, programs are very successful in popularization of science and technology resources. Uh, we also cooperate with some uh, companies to both explore the commercial value of our ocean science resources and uh, attract more attention to ocean science. For example, we develop a Gibson based on our research vessel Kershaw uh, One in the uh, most popular online uh, game in China named uh, Game for Peace. And uh, we also develop some culture uh, creative products uh, related to ocean literacy and built some uh, uh, foraminifer uh, sculpture parks uh, in several cities. Uh, as to me, I'm very happy uh, attending many ocean science education activities as a physical oceanographer. You know, uh, physics is usually uh, not so attractive uh, and understandable to people compared with colorful marine life. I conducted many um, scientific cruises in Western Pacific Ocean and uh, uh, served as chief scientist for three successful cruises. Uh, you know, female chief scientists on deep ocean cruise in China is relatively rare, and I'm a seasick too. So each cruise is an adventure to me, and there were many unforgivable moments. Some were exciting and profound, and some were suffering the tough. I learned a lot through these cruises, both professionally and uh, mentally. So I put some uh, basic physical oceanography knowledge into my interesting experiences and share my feelings in my lectures, which is very popular. I was invited as an honor guest by a very popular inspirational show named Voice in CCTV and by many other mainstream media. So this is a, a privilege for me as a female scientist. And I always use this to encourage school girls in my lecture. Uh, finally, is some thoughts and actions about the ocean literacy. Uh, we know we are experiencing a climate regime shift. Extreme events happen more and more frequently in recent years. So climate change is a challenge of our generation, and it is also a crisis multiplier that has profound implications for peace and stability of human society. Ocean is key to achieving climate and societal goals. More intelligent people should be engaged in ocean science and related sciences. However, data show that uh, the most top scholars in the college examination in China, they choose majors related to uh, economy and management. So I think simulate interest and desire for ocean science research is more important than delivering general knowledge to the younger generations. Uh, finally, uh, our CAS welcomes cooperation with, with international scientists and organizations and would like to share our ocean science education resources and experiences. We hope we can conduct some uh, education activities during docking of our research vessels in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hui. I have a quick question, quick, uh, quick question for you, which okay. is in, uh, in your experience, does language of communication play a part in delivering an effective message to the youth? No. Uh, in fact, my lecture, I gave the same lecture to both uh, primary school students and the college students and even graduate students. Uh, you know, my lecture is mainly about to inspire them uh, there, I feel, to engage in ocean science and uh, uh, to learn what um, we are doing for ocean science and uh, uh, what's the meaning for them to do this. So it's quite popular. <laughs> Okay, but you use the same language, do you mean? Um, mostly uh, for, um, for primary school students, I may make some cartoon picture to show these ideas. Yeah, basically the general idea is, is the same. 
I don't the idea is the same, but the language, how you express that is a little bit different, right? Um, you know, in China, uh, even pupils, they are very knowledgeable uh, for basic uh, knowledge about the ocean. So mostly it's not so professional. Mostly it's about the story, some experience. Because, uh, for example, I lost very important instruments during one cruise. But I spent over 40 hours and found it back. So during these processes, I suffered from seasick and uh, sleepiness. Uh, so I share this experience to them. Uh, yeah, mostly through this. OK. OK, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank it you. was uh, very nice to know a little bit of the China experience on ocean literacy. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. So our uh, next speaker is Professor Ming Yang King from um, School of o Earth Science uh, System Science in Kyung uh, Oak National University in South uh, Korea. She's going to talk a little bit more science communication to the public. Uh, so thank you very much for being with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you, Karina. I will share my screen first. Can you see it? <laughs> yes. Okay, I will start. Hello all, this is my honor to be here as a speaker in this session in ECOV Asia with my talk about the science communication to the public. I am Ming Young Kim, assistant professor in Gyeongbuk National University Department of Oceanography and I major in ocean chemistry. And my old friend, Dr. Jae Bak from Kyost, is a Korea Institution of Science and Technology. He invited me, thank again. So yeah, I will start with these words. These are keywords that I can explain about myself. Seagoing oceanographer, principal investigator, woman in science, early career, polar oceanographer, and faculty. Some are actually pretty strong keywords to communicate to public as they are closely related to the social issues. But in a global point of view, I have very little experiences to live out of Korea. I just spent around one year as a postdoc in Switzerland, but it is also a bit overlap to COVID periods, as you know. But I do have a lot of connections between public and scientists around the world. As you know, we have no physical border in science actually. And would like to tell you about my experiences regarding that. Uh, so roughly these are my main global collaborators around the world. But I will now on more focus on the age and academic stage of publics that I've met so far like this from primary school kids to senior scientists i will start with the youngest group of public so i've met kids in primary school in melbourne australia and middle and high school kids in south korea this is also closely related to my first degree as i majored in science education so basically, I had some chances to meet students as a student teacher and have a big interest to share science with kids. When I had a science talk to those young generation, their main questions were like those. What is oceanography? And what did you choose this job? Why did you choose this job? And do you travel a lot? And is it a free of charge? And do I need to swim well to be an oceanographer? It's really basic, some are pretty cute, and some are questions that I ever never imagined. So I think this kind of opportunity is not only good for kids, but also for us scientists to better understand what young public are curious about. Especially in Korea, we are learning oceanography as one small part of our science subject. 
So it is pretty necessary to directly communicate to those students about, tell them about what is real oceanography. And recently, I am started to working as Associated Editor in Frontiers for Young Minds, it's a genre, which is kind of my favorite genre. They just try to rewrite normal research papers to short and use simple vocabulary with pictures so children can approach to the real journal papers easier. They do have children reviewers, so these young public can actually learn how to publish a paper. I also did a YouTube lecture called Science Touch on Friday from Korea NSF. This is a program that explains about my research, especially done with Korea NSF. And most of the audience were actually focusing on the high school students. So it shouldn't be too difficult at the time. But as you know, YouTube is one of the biggest and major platform to communicate with broad people. Certainly, I received the most fast and broad responses from parents, friends, and all the relatives. Regarding the questions I received at the time, General Paul was interested in my life during the cruise. Especially, I was gone every Christmas season when I joined in the Antarctic cruises. So they were happy to see this kind of Christmas trees, cakes, and party pictures. They were also interested in some facilities of the vessels, whether it's freezing cold or not, and of course ask about the penguins, but also start to ask some questions about climate change and the status of polar science and oceanography of South Korea compared to other countries. It was especially very important question for me that I felt that my talk affects something in a good direction to those people. And it is a bit narrow range of public, but I also tried to join in mentoring programs if there is chances. So I was a mentor in Korea with Switzerland Exchange, which was done by Korea NSF again. By this, we have a group chat room and I made some new connections to multidisciplinary field of young people. So it is not only focusing on the science, but covers all the subjects like art, history, and economy. So yeah, it was also one of the nice chance for me to meet many people in different fields. As the early career scientist, I am also a member of the APEX. You can see the abbreviations here. It is a group of people who work together for a communication with the public. So we have an annual meeting between all these plenaries of polar sciences and do some information, do have some information about the summer school fundings and job opportunities. But also do some public events such as Polar Week, Antarctic Day, and some picture pricing and so on. And yeah, this is another example of my science communication with early careers. It's called DISCO. It's the Dissertation Symposium in Chemical Oceanographers. It is not a public, but a small group and similar academic stage of chemical oceanographers get together from all over the world. By this chance, I could have a group chat, main list, new collaborations, and new friends. One of the theme we discussed especially was about the woman in science, especially in our ages. Some women scientists just disappeared after married or their career, their career stopped by having a baby. So I felt more common sense by discussing this kind of thing with them. We also actually had a game to explain our main research result without using any scientific terms. It was pretty difficult even between physical oceanographers and chemical oceanographers. By this activities, I realized that vocabulary is really unimportant to break the wall. Well, also as the early career scientist, I made a brand new connection to senior scientists. With the funding chances of SCAR, as you can see here, 
This is the scientific comedy on Antarctic research. And they select three to four people a year and provide research funding. I basically heard about this COP program in APEX conferences. So this is also one of the good connections to communicate with many people as I can get more background information by them. So I applied to SCAR with Dr. Julia Muller and Gazna Molenhauer in RV. And surprisingly, I've never met them before and so far. So this is totally brand new connection started by this the public chances. Also, I am working with senior group of scientists a lot. One of the example is this SUS representative work is a Southern Ocean Observing System. Well, my Swiss friend let me know about this program because she remembered that I'm doing something in the Antarctic, which is also a good example of building a communication. Here in this group, I am learning how to work in global networking group. Especially within this group, we are trying to organize Southern Ocean data sets and write reports, which is also one of the ways to communicate to public. So to conclude, I would like to say that science is no longer a prison of a few group of scientists. So scientists ourselves are hoping to make multidisciplinary and multinational collaborations between scientists, which is really necessary and good but at the same time, it is also important to share our experiences to general public so more young minds are interested in our fields and we finally get more manpower by them. So I will be always happy to have connection chances to public. So please let me know if you have and let's go for it together. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. Um, and I will leave the, the question for Q&A questions for, for you, okay? Because we don't have okay. much time. Right. We are running out of time. Uh, but anyways, uh, we will have a space later on, uh, okay, for questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Jane, uh, Johnny Townsend from um, Tropical Marine Science Institute. Uh, at the National University of Singapore. She's going on to talk about engaging students and community hands-on with science. The floor is yours. Doctor, okay. Hi, okay, so <laughs> I have unmuted myself now. Uh, thank you very much to the conveners for having me here and especially thank you for to Hari for uh, arrowing me to give this talk for this session and uh, to everyone here for staying very late on a Friday evening um, or well morning or afternoon or wherever you're at. Um, so, okay, so um, I'm here to give uh, just a little bit of a sharing. I, I'm, I'm, I know that everyone here is very passionate about science communication, but I think um, here my role is really to just share what we've done here in Singapore might be slightly different from um, you know, challenges that's been faced in other sort of uh, West Tech countries. Um, so just a little bit more about myself. Um, I am a, a researcher at the Tropical Marine Science Institute. I mostly work with corals, uh, specifically to do with tree rings, um, and, sorry, coral rings, uh, and looking at ecological monitoring as well as, um, you know, looking into reef conservation strategies. Um, I also work at the St. John's Island National Marine Lab. So I'm part of the management team uh, over there. Um, and uh, just for those of you who may not be familiar with the St. John's Island Marine Lab, it is actually uh, Singapore's first and only marine uh, research station. Uh, but we're very proud to have, you know, a full set of aquarium facilities, a research vessel, research labs, um, and, and an education and outreach team, which is a very uh, a vibrant and what I, what I will be sharing a little bit more with you about today. Um, so for those of you who may not be familiar with Singapore, this is Singapore, we're, we're very small, about 725 square kilometers, and the marine station where I'm based and where I work at is uh, located in the southern part of um, uh, the Singapore, south, in southern part of Singapore on St. John's Island as part of the St. John's Island uh, complex. Uh, here you can see uh, the, the marine uh, uh, lab. And uh, the mission of the marine station is really um, 
as a national research infrastructure is a focal point for marine science research and education, uh, as well as a resource for marine science expertise. Uh, we support research for strategic national needs, but most importantly, it's a shared resource supported by skilled personnel that's open to everyone. So uh, researchers and students, both uh, from Singapore as well as international. So all of you are invited to come and work at the Marine Station with us. Um, so just a little bit more, I'm going a little bit fast because I'm mindful of the time, um, but <laughs> uh, moving forward here, I'm just also sharing a little bit more about myself and where I have platforms for engagement to engage uh, students and community uh, hands-on with science. Um, so in addition to working at the, Nas uh, the National Marine Lab, where we do have an education outreach um, um, mission, uh, I am also involved in the Singapore Institute of Biology, where um, for the past, past eight, eight years, I've been actively as a council member and the last four years as the president, but I've recently stepped down. I'm also a coordinator at the Friends of the Marine uh, Park community, uh, a member of the Blue Water Volunteers, where uh, we coordinate uh, resurveys for citizen scientists as well, and an editor for the Singapore Blue Plan. So uh, this is just sort of sharing with you, not because uh, you know, the fact that, you know, I have no life outside of work, but also this is where, um, you know, where my engagement, uh, you know, engaging students and community sort of uh, focus around these sort of these groups uh, that I'm involved in. So I think the first question is like, why engage students and community in Singapore with hands-on science? Um, I think for those of you who have visited Singapore and know Singapore, it's very urbanized. We don't have a lot of nature and, and natural environment left. For instance, we only have coral reefs, we only have about 13 square kilometers left down from about 100 square kilometers pre-1950s and you know, uh, 50 square kilometers from the 1950s onwards. We've lost a lot of uh, our natural environment. And um, for education, um, engaging students, and um, there's a saying that you can't love what you don't know much about. Um, and what I think is that, um, you know, you can't love and trust what you don't know much about. So it's extremely important um, to really uh, get uh, students to know more about uh, the world, uh, the natural environment around them, because so soon and even now, we face a range of environmental and societal challenges as a result of climate change and uh, growing population needs. And uh, for climate change education, I think it's an essential element for mitigation strategies, a, a keystone even, and, arming real, and really arming a society with the right knowledge and understanding encourages changes in attitudes that will help with adaptation to climate change uh, and related environmental disturbances and promoting behaviors uh, that, uh, that you know, um, uh, add towards sustainability. And you know, we have studies that have shown that connection with nature is very important for promoting good environmental behaviors and therefore man maintaining a citizenry that is more eco-conscious. Um, and you know, in Singapore being uh, so urbanized, rebuilding that connection with nature and developing responsible actions and interactions with the environment is a key step in that whole sort of process. Um, so in strengthening capacity and literacy in marine science and environment, um, within the capacity of the marine station, we have here the uh, education outreach team. So I'm not doing this alone, you know, the, the team effort. Um, we have, uh, we do conduct hands-on, uh, a bit more bespoke workshops for students, um, but also programs that, in, that are sort of set, like for instance, this STEP Environment Camp, which is a youth exchange for climate change and environmental sustainability for ASEAN plus uh, countries. Uh, not only we have workshops for students, but we also have workshops for teachers, because we realize that, um, you know, if we don't train the teachers, uh, as well as the students, then the teachers will not, without us, the teachers will not be able to, uh, you know, uh, have capacity to teach the, the students themselves. Um, so we have um, both workshops and programs for students and teachers. Um, in order to sort of, uh, and beyond workshops, there are also research project opportunities that uh, we provide uh, to engage students deeper, for deeper hands-on learning. Um, so these learning and engagement opportunities are not just limited within uh, in, for undergraduate students like uh, most research projects are, but they're this one particular, the Young Marine Scientist Award was open to 
students anywhere between 17 years old to 25 years old. So pre-university, polytechnic, uh, anyone can come in and um, you know, uh, write a proposal and then perform their research, mentored by um, you know, uh, scientists from the Marine Station and uh, you know, other sort of uh, universities at large. Um, and this program last went uh, sort of went for five years. We supported over 44 projects. Um, and these are just some examples of the projects that um, the students sort of have done. Um, but um, these opportunities, you know, you sort of, I'm sort of sharing a lot from the Marine Station, but uh, it's not just limited within the domain of the Marine Station. So in the Explore Marine Science uh, pro program, we work very closely with the Friends of the Marine Park community, um, which is, um, which is where my day job and extracurricular activities converge. So the Friends of the Marine Park community consists of stakeholders from civil society, business, academia, so that's where I come in, and also the government, because uh, the Friends of the Marine Park community is administered by the National Parks Board here in Singapore. Um, and this network really encourages community members to really collaborate for the long-term survival of the seas. So in the instance of the Explore uh, Young Marine Scientist program, where the students do research, uh, we engage the we engage uh, the students to also conduct their research in uh, a bay that is managed by the community, um, you know, administered by the National Parks Board, the government agency, but um, managed by this community network, where the students can come in and then conduct research, then which they will then share with the community again. Um, and the whole idea for this is really to build to empower a community as stewards and custodians of a, ma a marine environment. Um, really the area that they've given us to manage is a lagoon on St. John's Island, which is not much, but in the context of Singapore, it's actually a lot. <laughs> um, and it's not just research and education that's conducted there. There's also engagement with recreation, so kayakers, scuba divers, you know, the yachters, the boaters, uh, as well ex as, well as ex-islanders um, of St. John's Island. That's where the heritage uh, portion comes in. Uh, you can see at the photos on the bottom right here, you see a uh, traditional kole. This was actually built in Batam in Indonesia uh, and was the traditional mode of transport uh, for the, um, uh, for the ex-islanders between um, St. John's Island and uh, the Indonesian uh, islands. And um, just sort of very quickly, the Singapore Blue Plan um, also is an outcome of this community effort uh, where we came up with this document uh, that we present to the, for, to the government every decade. Uh, we had over 100 co contributors. And while I've been sharing a lot of extracurricular activities, so basically, you know, education efforts that are not within school, the school domain, one of the things that the Singapore Blue Plan really pushed for was the incorporation of topics uh, on, on the natural environment into, into school syllabus. And promote science to, and promoting science communication. Uh, this is really important because I think you know um, the, the engaging students. We are engaging students. A lot of us, all of us here, are engaging students after the fact. You know, like they're they're out of school. They're we're engaging it outside of school. But I think it's really important for us to also try and get them started. You know, early on when they're in school. Um, so that's where we, the other effort that I've been, been involved in is actually the Singapore Biology in, in, uh, in Singapore Institute of Biology, where we run the biology Olympiads, including the Singapore Junior Biology Olympiad, um, and training the team up uh, to be a sent off for the, for the uh, Team Singapore as part of the International Biology Olympiad, where it covers a whole bunch of topics, including ecology, but a lot of schools don't really teach ecology until they have to. They focus on things like physiology, you know, cell and molecular biology, because a lot of students want to go to, say, medical school, that they're in the biology field because they want to go to medical school. But through the biology Olympiads, um, the, the committee and the, the, the question sectors, we try and incorporate more ecology questions so then the students study and mug for ecology, uh, ecology in the ecology sort of chapters uh, as part of their studies, um, which then they apply for this extracurricular activity with the hope that teachers then also help um, this. 
So I know I'm really short on time now. I think Karina's like yeah, I'm over time. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, but just I just wanted to just finally share with you that uh, Singapore recently just uh, came out. The youth of Singapore just um, you know came out with a document uh, as part of the COP uh, 26 youth sort of statement to try and push for protection of the remaining natural habitats, including our ocean spaces in Singapore, in line with global targets. So, so I think this is really heartening to see. And uh, finally, I just wanted to say that um, fish, as fish, just as fishes do not recognize geolo geopolitical, geopolitical borders, trash, unwanted hitchhikers, you know, microbes, nutrients, pollutants, uh, marine issues cannot therefore be managed by one country alone and solutions. And, and the ocean science that inform the solutions uh, really need to be transboundary and multilateral in nature. And this requires close collaboration. And so building the base of these relationships early, like for, for example, through this uh, incubator workshop that the conveners have very nicely put together is going to be really, really important uh, moving forward in this UN decade of ocean science. Okay, and that's all from me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, I bet we have many questions uh, because it's very <laughs> interesting, all the job you do uh, in Singapore, uh, but we will leave the questions for the Q&A session, okay? No, no. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and for, uh, um, for next speaker, I would like to invite Dr. Intan uh, Nurhati um, from Research Center for Oceanography the National Research and Innovation Agency in Indonesia. Um, I'm looking forward uh, to listen more, uh, to learn more from her because she's going to uh, talk about communication with policymakers, which um, we don't, uh, we are not very familiar with. So thank you very much for being with us. Uh, and nice to meet you né, in person. <laughs> so the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks again, ECOP, for inviting and initiating. Uh, special thanks to Corina and Bhaktiwi here for connecting. Uh, I realize I have a bigger job because 11% of us here uh, are comfortable with policymakers. So we have, uh, we still need to push ourselves. So let me sh share my screen. Oops. All right, uh, my name is Intan. I'm a researcher at the Research Center for Oceanography. Um, I'm also the Director of Communications for the Indonesian Young Academy of Science. Um, so this whole science communication is something, for me, it's a, uh, it's a self-learning thing. I just learn by myself, and, uh, but like many of you here, uh, we are very uh, passionate about science communications, and it kind of started with that way. So the basic point is we all want to have impact. Uh, as scientists, young, old, or seniors, we all uh, want to have impact, not only in the science a part of our work, which we work so hard, but how it will have impact to, to stakeholders and policymakers. So it's important that we have this mentality, science to science, yes, from journals. Uh, then we do a lot of science telling, telling immediate information to stakeholders, and then we have to package uh, our scientific publications into materials that are easily digestible. And everybody can do this uh, no matter how early you are in your stage. But I might be talking to um, preaching to the crowd here, but uh, let's keep in mind that it is our duty as scientists. A lot of our work are funded by um, public, public funds. It's important that we educate, inform, and uh, also more importantly is influence. We can't influence policymakers in my field. Uh, they are policy negotiators. So to give them ammunition for uh, climate negotiations from uh, what we know about the state of climate change and what kind of options that we need to take. And I know everybody's probably feel uncomfortable at the beginning when we do science communications, uh, be that in, in, in the media or to policymakers but it is a very important step that we all start from early on in our career. It's important that we take our jacket, our scientific jacket off. And that's why we need to talk to people who are not familiar with science, uh, because that's the only way we can step back 
from our understanding and really understand what they need and what kind of scientific information that they can package into action. And uh, this whole processes and activities uh, really opens new ways for us to present our science. And it's, sort of, it's also important that we make mistakes. I think everybody, when we talk to uh, science community, uh, to, to the media or policymakers, we get this fear. Uh, what if I make mistakes? And granted, you will make mistakes, but that's the important things about starting early in your career because you can learn a lot from uh, your mistakes or being uh, misquoted by media or policymakers. Because, uh, for example, one of the tips that you have to do when you talk to the media you tell them what you want to say, but you also tell them what you don't mean. It's very important because otherwise you can get misquoted uh, easily. And it's a two-way street. We often think that because we're scientists, we know more than a uh, general public, but by doing this conversations, we learn a lot from them. We, we learn to see the bigger pictures. We often get new research directions because, because they ask what kind of research that we haven't done. Uh, and then also the power of media and policymakers to really make actions. Now, um, we can talk about policymakers, but we also have to think about stakeholders who have the ability to make actions in the ground. Um, as we are working uh, in, in the developing countries, often we are being pushed to really explain our science and what's the benefit, the real urgent benefit of, of our, our science. And it's often difficult for us working in oceanography and climate science, where we need very long data before we actually can get publications, right? So for us in this situation, it's important that we design our science that it will have immediate benefit while it have a longer benefit. So I will quote this, let, let's sail as we are building the ship. So for example, is if you need a long climate data, it's probably a good idea to explore a way that the data is available to society right away. Uh, as simple as oceanographic data, as uh, like temperature, uh, changes in ocean parameters. But if we can make that a real-time information, and if that location is near uh, places like marine park, uh, national park, or places with a lot of marine culture, this is very powerful. We can have immediate data telling them right away if there is any potential for coral bleaching, so they can perhaps close the marine park uh, temporarily. Uh, and in the meantime, we can get a lot of climate data for our uh, science uh, work. So this is something that we need to explore. Uh, and this is something that I, I learned a lot once I moved to Indonesia, because I really have to explain my immediate um, impact for uh, my, the immediate impact of my science. And, this is often not very easy. Something that I would like to encourage, whatever works that you do, whatever papers that you do, try to make bigger impact from that paper. You work so hard from it for your paper. Let's not let that uh, paper sit in your desk, okay? So let's push more. So uh, this is just some examples of the recent papers that we did. So we got this paper published. And we always play around more with this. So we always uh, put it in social media, make a more uh, interesting uh, content. You can put it on Instagram. And then there's also a lot of sort of science-focused media, like the conversations. So the conversations, actually, only scientists or students who are working on their PhD can write articles on the conversations. So it's a very science-proven kind of media. So what uh, we always do, once we publish a paper, we would contact um, uh, people from the conversations and discuss about what kind of articles that we could write. And it's also important that you connect with the HR department in your institutions and make a press release. Uh, you can write the press release and pass it to them because they have a huge network of media that they can pass it to. And this is really why, uh, we, how we can get a lot of impact, a lot of people listening or taking advantage of things that we want to highlight in our paper. And you can also make policy brief. Policy brief is not as uh, intimidating as it sounds, actually. It's purely, you condense your scientific results 
And then you find stakeholders, uh, you make it into one or two pages of information and find stakeholders or um, you know, your connections uh, likely in the government that can use this. And this is something that we do, for example, in the work for marine debris, we understand we need to cut down uh, plastic, uh, plastic bags, but in the case of Jakarta, we also need to reduce styrofoam. So once we uh, release our, our publications, we made a one or two pages of policy brief and uh, gave it to the uh, local government of Jakarta. So they have this information that the next step of regulation is not enough to stop in the plastic bag, banning plastic bag, but we have to start reducing styrofoam as well because that's what our scientific data shows. It's very dominant in the environment. And another story is that a recent paper on, you probably heard about how the uh, PPEs, uh, plastic made PPEs increase in the environment during the pandemic because we use it for masks um, and other types of PPEs. And we did this, uh, we did this research in Jakarta and lo and behold, we barely saw any, you know, PPEs before the pandemic, the COVID-19, and it just jumped right away. And we we published this paper, we wrote in, at the, in the conversations, and we did a press release. And one day after, and it was a New Year Eve, uh, we got contacted by the government. But what's really cool about this, the government say, we really appreciate this. It, it, it's a good journal, it's a good paper, uh, published in good journals, but we want you to give us solutions. So it was not something on our paper, but it really pushed us to talk to our colleagues in the same institute. Hey, we have this paper, we didn't really have solutions, uh, but you guys have a lot of technical solutions. We have this one department that do a lot of uh, studies of research on green technologies. So less than 24 hours, we just get together, I had a, a Zoom conversations, and present the issue and then the solutions that the Institute uh, can offer. And they actually push us to create more of this kind of papers because they wanna make policies based on science. Uh, and they also push us to give recommendations. So it became a policy brief uh, with, with the issues and the solutions from our Institute. So I guess what we also need to highlight that it's important that Institute also have some kind of ways uh, every institute have public uh, PR. So that's use, use them, you know, talk to them. Uh, so whenever you publish a paper, uh, communicate and prepare this one page thing to them. And uh, some institute also have departments. Uh, for example, now at, at Brain, we have specific department for translating uh, science into policies. So take a look of this rev uh, avenues and really, uh, you know, use this because it can really, uh, uh, you know, increase the impact of your papers. And uh, I'm also, I was involved in the IPCC, the, the latest report for the sixth assessment report. And this is interesting because IPCC, so in the UN, there are only two bodies. One is IPCC, which is full of scientists, and the other one is UNFCCC, which is uh, full of negotiators. So the process should be that the science inform uh, policymakers. So this is a very, I think, cool role of scientists, uh, how we can give a lot of ammunition to policymakers, to uh, negotiators before they go for climate negotiation at the UNFCCC. So I could always see this uh, when I work together, for example, from um, people from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who go to these conferences, uh, to the UNFCCC, I feel like I can uh, give them a lot of ammunition so they can succeed in the climate negotiations. And I think that's just a very cool role that we uh, as scientists, young or seniors can really contribute. So uh, the basic rule is always start with good science, uh, good solid uh, scientific data, and always see the big pictures. We tend to see the smaller pictures as scientists because that's what we do, uh, but make analogy, humanize your objects. I often say that the ocean is our mother because that's the only way that people can uh, have empathy to mothers because you know we evolve from, from, from the ocean. So that's why it is our mothers and uh, oceans always protects us from all this um, 
uh, effects of climate change, for example, it absorbs carbon from the atmosphere, uh, and then it becomes an issue of ocean acidification. And then you also have to relate to your policymakers. Don't be so scientists. Uh, think about their issues, their missions, their language. So when we talk about climate to uh, negotiators, it's not enough that we say, oh, we need more data. That's, that's our issue as scientists. But you have to talk about how they can have options or ideas to use technology and financial routes, which is what they do in negotiations based on what you know about the state of climate change. So be the bridge between science and their world. And this takes a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, interactions as well. And start now. Often I hear about, oh, I'm still young, I'm so nervous, I'm an introvert. It has nothing to do with that. If you start now, you probably can make early, early mistakes and you can get better and better communicators, starting with uh, public and then you can, as, as opportunities come, you can talk more and ele elevate the science for policymakers. So that's my experience, but that's something I learned uh, as from experience. And I hope, and I think it will be more of the trends that young scientists now uh, becoming, they have to talk more and be in the front of science uh, talking to policymakers because every, uh, that we have to have uh, science-based policy making in whatever country you live. So that's all from me. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, I think we need to learn uh, and not be shy net to contact and uh, communicate with policymaker because we really need. It's very important. Um, and we have questions for you about we, just the Q&A session, OK? Uh, now I would like to call uh, my uh, my friend Rafael from Iwate University, uh, but I will give a um, few minutes. OK, Rafael, five minutes, because we are run out of time. So he's um, from UAT University and he's uh, part of the Pisces uh, network as well. And today he's going to explain a, a little bit of the Pisces science communication approach. The floor is yours. Thank you, Karina. I tried to do it in two, five minutes. That should work. Um, so hi, everyone. So my name is Rafael Roman and I'm currently based in Japan. I'm also a member of ECOP Asia and the uh, early career ocean professional group in Pisces. And I'm going to actually talk right now about their science communication approaches and initiatives across North Pacific. Uh, okay. Um, so the North Pacific, so Pisces is also called the North Pacific Marine Science Organization. For those of you who don't know them, uh, as it's an intergovernmental organization that was established around 20 years ago. Uh, we have six member representative countries. So Japan, China, and South Korea in East Asia, Russia, as well as Canada and the United States of America on the other side of the Pacific. So Pisces structure is really here to facilitate integrated multidisciplinary science projects that connect organizations, countries and cultures across the North Pacific. Um, it primarily functions to facilitate marine scientific collaboration and research between the member countries uh, and also other external partner organizations in other ocean basins, for example. But it doesn't really fulfill adv an advisory role. It mainly provides scientific information to the member countries. So BICES is really a transdisciplinary organization that includes researchers from a wide variety of disciplines, from natural sciences to the human dimension of uh, the ocean, so fishery science, oceanography, pollution, etc. And recently, there is there's been more focus on incorporating social scientists to work at the intersection of natural and uh, anthropogenic uh, systems, and more and more um, also impetus from science communication and early career ocean professional, which I'm going to talk about right now. So until now, the science communication approach from Pisces, from Pisces has been to, uh, to synthesize scientific information uh, through different types of publications. It could be scientific and technical reports, peer-reviewed journals, uh, brochures, et cetera. Also Pisces Press, which is, uh, which is being published uh, two times a year and allows the broader public and everyone uh, actually is being distributed to more than 5,000 scientists across the North Pacific to kind of learn more about activities, doing conferences, thoughts from scientists and uh, etc. For example, on this one, it's basically, um, it talks about this, uh, one of the first, or the first 
uh, science communication workshop that happened during the annual conference in 2019. So just before COVID swept the world and it was really successful. So people were here, they were like um, science communicators who came to train scientists about how to use social media to be able to communicate your research better, how to take a video to upload it on YouTube and many more other kind of skills that scientists were really eager to learn uh, during this workshop. And all those different outreach materials are really the products of cross-Pacific collaborations. So in terms of social media platforms, uh, Pisces has been on Twitter for like uh, a little bit more than a year. Uh, it's pretty active recently, and I encourage all of you to follow uh, the Twitter accounts if you're interested. There's also YouTube channels where they're uploading quite regularly um, recordings from past conferences and workshops. Uh, there's also more and more videos that we're trying to do right now for early career ocean professionals, but also other scientists to upload videos about um, what their research is all about, what is their relationship with Pisces, and kind of help them to communicate more with not only the Pisces community, but to really kind of uh, share their research and work with local government, um, NGOs, and other people that are not that are all across the world. So a, a really big step within Pisces uh, since a year now is uh, besides having engaged a bit more early career ocean professionals is there's been a new science communication study group that was here to really help Pisces become a leader in marine science communication. And so the study group was really here to provide the tools and, and skills to uh, more effectively communicate the importance of Pisces science. And it's become more and more important, especially within the context of the UN decade for ocean, uh, of ocean science for sustainable development. And within this group, they really try to encourage the inclusion of practitioners, such as policymakers, but also communication specialists, uh, so designers, videographers, and artists. And I think currently they have one or two designers from Japan who have been joining the group and helping to uh, update the website and make uh, visually appealing products to better communicate uh, the science, uh, the, the scientific work from uh, the organization. And now the, the big good news is like the science communication group uh, will now probably move to what we call an advisory panel, which will allow science communication activities within Pisces to last for five, six, seven years. So to better plan and implement those particular science communication activities to improve cross-sectoral collaboration and more capacity building in that matter. Um, quickly too, we also have a new, uh, there's, Pisces has an officially endorsed a program called SmartNet, which is a global knowledge network for ocean science to strengthen by strengthening and expanding collaboration with partners from around the world. Uh, this is an issue from the Eco magazine that was, I think, a special issue in the UN decade. It's freely and publicly available if you want to learn more about this project that will help to leverage the voices of ind indigenous knowledge holders, um, also ECOPS, and of course, more science communication. So like, if you're interested, you can send me a message and I can contact, uh, I can put you in, in touch with a uh, uh, senior scientist uh, within Pisces who work on this specifically. And then quickly, this is something we did with our early career ocean professional group. So we created flyers uh, to spread around the North Pacific to ask people across the world, uh, uh, sorry, to ask like early career ocean professional across the North Pacific to join us, uh, depending on their commitment, or, um, depending on the commitment they're, they're, uh, they're uh, okay to put into. So we have different commitment opportunities and we try to actually also spread the word in different languages. So we've been able to translate it into Russian and South Korea and in Korean as well. And it's really to reach a broader audience within each country, because as Lin Wing talked earlier, we also have problem with language barriers uh, within the different countries uh, in Pisces, because we have the majority of them don't have English as their uh, mother tongue. So we've been trying to push more for Pisces to include to translate more and more the scientific outputs and other kind of uh, findings uh, on a daily, um, regularly uh, during the year. And yeah, I'm done, but just to say, this is a few upcoming events to be on the lookout for. I would specifically emphasize that if you're, uh, there's the fourth IC Spices Early Career Science Scientist Conference happening next year in May, 2022. Abstract is still, you, you can still submit your abstract until December 17th. And there is a special session on science communication, inspiration and engagement that I, that I will be co-convening. And if you want to talk about your experience in science communication or the methods you use, please, I would be really glad if you could submit an abstract. Uh, you have one month left. So yeah, that'd be all for me. Thank you very much for inviting me.
Thank you so much, and <laughs> sorry to make you hurry up. Um, but now I would like to encourage you uh, to fill it up our feedback, uh, just to know what you learned from our session today. And um, uh, from your feedback, we can improve our next uh, workshops and activities and to provide a better, like, uh, better uh, outcomes uh, next time. Uh, so uh, the link is in the chat box. Uh, please fill that up the, uh, the feedback for us. Uh, I would like to invite our next, uh, the last speaker uh, of this session is Sunanda Narayan. Uh, she's PhD, PhD student at IIT Kharagpur in India. And um, I will give a five minutes as well, Sunanda, sorry about that, um, okay. <laughs> to talk about uh, the network in India. Yes, thank this you. Morning. Thank you so much. I'll share my screen. Is it visible? Yes. Okay. So I feel extremely privileged uh, to be a part of this uh, kickoff conference and I'm representing the ECOP India Network. So today I would be talking about some SINCOM activities in India by the ECOP Network. I am a doctoral student at the Indian Institute of Technology, Karakpur. Now uh, we have already talked about this. So the early career ocean professionals are a group of young researchers uh, in, who are early in their careers in oceanography and elite fields. So the ECOP India mainly aims at bringing the research scholars, early career scientists across the country under the tagline, the global ECOP, who will work towards the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. Okay, so uh, these are some of the goals that, uh, that we are working on uh, currently. So we are working on creating awareness among all about the ocean and the need for the ocean decade. So I myself is a research scholar, so, but I, I am, and I'm working for ocean, oceanography, everything. But the thing is whether my research is contributing towards mitigating climate change, mitig uh, whether I am contributing towards achievement of sustainable goals is really a question is in many of our minds. So we are trying to create awareness among, uh, among everybody about the ocean and the need for the ocean ticket, why we need a better ocean for future generations. So, this awareness network will include school children, graduate students, research scholars, and young scientists. So currently, we have we are uh, we are successful in creating awareness between the research scholars and young scientists. Now we aim to create awareness among the school children and graduate students and push them towards this oceanography and work towards a better ocean. Now next will be bringing action and practice sustainability. Now, well we. We all can practice sustainability in our daily life. Now, everybody, every one of us are working towards climate change, but how many of us are practicing sustainability? So this is very important. How each of us can, each of our action can bring, uh, can, uh, can bring a lot of more changes to our earth and everything. So that is another thing that we have to uh, look into. We have to bring action and practice sustainability in our daily life. And next is create a common platform. We all have a lot of ideas. We do a lot of research, but we have to create a common platform for exchanging these ideas and encourage children to practice sustainable options. Now, uh, the one example I can give is that we can encourage children to use fountain pens instead of the regular ballpoint pens, which can actually reduce the number of uh, pens that they consume in their day-to-day -day life and throughout the year. So I myself, I'm using a fountain pen since the last three years. So because of that, I now I realize that I have not purchased a ballpoint pen in the last three years, which is, I feel very great. So this awareness I can give, I, we can provide with the children as well. And now next is, as everybody has talked, it's the widening the network and regular communication for now and the near future. So we all have one aim, that is preserve our ocean, save it for the future generation. Now the project objective will be collectively work towards the UN Decade of Ocean Science Sustainable Goals through our research, action, and knowledge. Now these are some of the activities that uh, we have already conducted. So on World Ocean Day, we had released a video comprising researchers across India and their answer to how they can contribute their research towards these sustainable goals. And uh, this was compiled with inputs from various institutes in India. And we also conducted an art contest 
among kids and elders to showcase their talents and the theme of the competition was what does ocean mean to you so these are some of the entries or no all the entries that i we achieved in the children category and all these children were less than uh, 10 years of age so it it's very overwhelming to and it's very nice to see children participating in such contest and they realize what ocean mean to them now dr t srinivas kumar director inco has announced the winners of the art contest on world ocean day and we have distributed the prizes to all the entries in the kids category because they need more they need to be motivated for future competitions as well so we uh, we gave prizes to all the uh, entries in the kids category and in the elder category we have uh, chosen the best three now this this is a glimpse of our video i have given the video link here you can go through that now for ocon 2021 which is a biennial con conference conducted by the ocean society of india a contest was conducted for students and research scholars to prepare a road map for achieving the un decade of ocean science sustainable goals and the best proposals were given awards during the ocon 2021 conducted in august now mts india section conducted a preload event to oceans 22 which will be happening in chennai in uh, february 2022 and this event also had a lot of participation among the research scholars and kids and this is again uh, opened up more opportunities for young researchers on world ocean day again we had a talk conducted by the ocean society of india on the topic the antarctic ocean hole and montreal protocol so and yes we had a panel discussion on career opportunities and challenges for women in earth science and this was well received by all the research scholars school students and the discussion were quite fruitful now what can we do we can cut down plastic wherever we can in our daily life uh, then reduce carbon footprint moderation is the key minimize wherever possible and we have to educate we have to educate the public with whatever we know and in a in a language in a way that they can understand now these are some of the future events that will be happening in india one is the oceans 22 and there will be an event on women in engineering event which will be conducted during the conference in chennai and the next is indian indian national indian ocean science conference which will be conducted in goa in march 2022 so thank you thank you very much uh, sunanda for this hard task uh, to <laughs> <laughs> i i had to rush because the time was quite less so uh, yeah i can answer the questions in few minutes yeah <laughs> and i know you have more to say yeah. um but yeah but now i would like to um to invite uh pradeep singh from malaysia to open the panel discussion um where we are going to uh make some questions to address the questions for our our, uh, our speakers is the floor is yours my friend <laughs> uh <clears throat> thank you thank you very much karina and and thank you uh, to all the speakers for such a fantastic event uh my name is pradeep singh i'm from malaysia although i'm currently based in germany uh, and my expertise is on the law of the sea international environmental law uh, and ocean governance um, and part of my responsibilities is to provide and to prepare Uh, to provide advice and to prepare um, delegates that attend international conferences and i think intan mentioned one of it the unf triple c climate change conference uh, but also um, other multilateral meetings uh, such as on the convention on the biological but diversity um, as well as you know uh, meetings at the international maritime organization and so on so i i, I provide ocean related uh, Uh, advice to to delegates attending these meetings um and i think one of the sort of very important key message that came across um all presenters uh, from all presenters today is the importance of communication to policy makers and also the importance uh, to educate the the younger generation because they are the future leaders as well as future voters uh, and it's important to expose them not just to the issues and the problems that the oceans are facing but also to sort of familiarize them uh, with both the language of science as well as the language of policy so that they would be comfortable working with each other and i, I think you know it was quite telling to see the polls earlier of how you know uncomfortable most of us are in in speaking to policy makers uh, so i guess i'm one of the sort of minorities here today because i come from the legal policy background and not from the natural sciences 
uh, although my work requires me a lot uh, to, co to, to collaborate and communicate a lot with scientists. Uh, so I have a, a few broad and open questions uh, to all of the speakers, um, particularly you know, to ask, um, firstly, could you share some experiences that you had in communication with, with policymakers or, or government officials in your work? How open are they to sort of listen to what you have to say? And, and can you share some success stories or, or even occasions where you were not able to get the, to get the message across to them? Um, secondly, a lot of the messaging today has been in the direction uh, of scientists communicating with policymakers. Any thoughts on the other way around? Should policy be, um, policymakers also be you know, communicating and going in the other direction? Um, and thirdly, uh, it's, it's also a question that has sort of come up in the chat from Hari. Um, how should the messaging actually be? Uh, if we really want policymakers to react, would it be more conducive to use uh, positive messaging as to, to give a, a message of hope or negative uh, messaging, you know, a more picture of doom and gloom uh, or a combination of both? So, you know, I'd be happy to hear from any of the panelists. Uh, any thoughts, very quick thoughts, please. No more than a minute on this. Um, especially from Intan or even Jani, I think you mentioned the Singapore Blue Plan. You know, how has this been received by the government, uh, as well as any of the other speakers? So, floor is open. Please jump in. Go ahead, Jani. I see you're ready to to speak. I, no, I mean, it, yeah. So uh, thanks, Pradeep. Pradeep. Um, I, uh, yeah, so the Singapore Blue Plan, I think it's, um, it is, it's an effort that we're trying to, uh, it's a community effort, ground up initiative, where we're trying to engage the government. Um, it, it, it's actually quite well received. Uh, we put forth six recommendations, including uh, you know, prioritizing areas of marine conservation in, Sing for, in Singapore and along with, you know, long-term funding that we will need. I, I, I see funding as a theme <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> in the initial talks of like how, how important it is for, you know, greasing the wheels for all these, um, you know, um, sustainability efforts as well as uh, ocean science uh, research. Um, and uh, it's still very much, uh, it's, it's still slow in the, pushing out, you know, making, sh making sure that concrete outcomes come from these recommendations uh, because we're working uh, on the ground um, and it's dealing with policymakers, like what Intan mentioned, you know, this, and, and all of us here uh, have to deal with, with. And I feel like we're currently, the scientists and the, the academics are like the middle, uh, so trying to communicate with the policymakers as well as trying to uh, talk to the masses and the public um, and then trying to get everyone to, come to some sort of um, concrete actionable items. Um, and I find that the most difficult. Um, uh, and one of the things that I had put in the, uh, in the survey was um, how better was to ask maybe uh, how better can we find, we're, we've talked talk a lot about how to deal with policymakers, but is there also a way to, um, a, a way to message things uh, effectively to the masses? Uh, as well, um, it, I, we deal a lot with students, we're comfortable with students, but these are the average Joes, the uncles and the aunties, the machis and the pakchis, you know, at the restaurant, at the you know, mama shop or whatever. <laughs> uh, how, how can we then engage them as well? Because I, I, I do feel that at the end of the day, we're, we're kind of like preaching to the converted and we're, we tend to be like quite a, a, a small minority at the end of the day, but you know, 80, 90% of the rest of the population are, are these, uh, you know, the the uncle, the pachis and machis that may not care. So, um, I think the greatest challenge for the Singapore Blue Plan is re is not really trying to engage the government at this point. For us, it's trying to engage sort of the masses to come on board. Yeah. yeah thank Thank you for that, Jani. And I think if you get the masses on board, that would sort of you know compel yeah, the exactly. government to come to the table uh, as well. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the biggest problem that I have always faced is this sort of, you know, policymakers always saying that we need to find middle ground on certain issues. And, and the problem with that is on some matters, there's actually no middle ground, you know, science is really clear on certain things, um, but it's still very difficult to get the policymakers to, to come on board and to act as we also just saw in, in the recent COP uh, uh, meeting. So thank you for that. Uh, and maybe then finally, since we're running out of time, could I invite Intan to maybe uh, quickly address the, the third question? 
um, on, on these sort of type of messaging that, that should be used. Uh, and of course, if you have any other quick thoughts, please go ahead. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks, Pradeep. Um, yes, I, I guess the main point is that we have to be in their shoes, right? Uh, we, we come from a scientific background. Uh, we are scientists, but in the end, it's what kind of scientific message that we can use to help them. So when we talk about policymakers, though, it's important that there are different kinds of policymakers. Uh, they are local government, which tends to need solutions locally. So you have to uh, not just raise the issue, but also offer options that they can take as real actions. So that's very important to be in their shoes. Now, in our scientific paper, we may not have uh, solutions because it's very scientific. But it's important that we dig more into this issue, what kind of solutions and perhaps what kind of uh, regulations that are in place now that could be improved. So that's why I said we have to be the bridge. We have to be in the middle. We cannot be in our science camp. We have to kind of move a bit. Uh, and then also there are other kinds of policymakers. Uh, Pradeep mentioned about people who go to COP. Uh, and also there are different people on this uh, group as well. There are people, for example, from the Ministry of Environment their issue is, of course, to look at the impacts, what kind of loss and damages. So those are the information that they need, that we need to supply. Whereas uh, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we have to keep in mind that when it comes to foreign affairs, it's not just a matter of, of environments. There's an economics, there's a geopolitical. So you have to get their mind. Okay, what, what are you trying to achieve and how science can uh, be part of it? But it's important that uh, the government that you support is also uh, uh, environmentally minded government. I guess that's without, without saying. Uh, it's important we know their head, their missions, because we also don't want science to get uh, cherry pick into something that we all don't hope to be. So I guess the basic message is think about their roles, what they need to achieve, and mix with what kind of scientific information you can help to reach this good cause that they're trying to do. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Intan, that's, that's fantastic. And I can also personally relate to it uh, because in these sort of roles that I perform in providing advice to delegates, um, and it, it, it usually gets very well received with the environmental ministries, but then later on when it's sort of being brought together in the whole sort of wider delegation with influence from the economic and foreign affairs, it thinks, you know, the dynamics are quite different. So thank you very much. Uh, I would like now to hand over again to uh, the conveners, to, to Karina and, and to Hari uh, to then uh, take us to the end of the session. Thank you very much, all speakers and panelists. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, I had a problem with my video right now. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Pradeep. <laughs> uh to moderate this session um and i would like to um, um yeah to tell you guys if you want to join us uh the ecop asia so i just sent um the email so you can contact us it's very inter interesting for us to have more people on board uh that to um make more activities uh under the un decade in this region and develop um develop more this network and to support more the more ECOPs as many as possible. So, and also I would like uh, to say thank you to all people involved in this workshop. Uh, it was amazing and I hope uh, we can work in collaboration uh, in the future. So, Hari, do you have uh, something to say? <laughs> No, I would just like to reiterate, thank you everybody for participating. I think it's been a great set of talks and I particularly enjoyed all of them. And I think the survey results are showing the same too. So probably we'll uh, publish this later uh, and you can see that, but thank you for all the uh, discussions and the feedback. Have and also uh, if you can turn on your camera, uh, if it's possible, to take a picture, a group picture, it would be very nice to see your face as well. Unfortunately, my camera is not working, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, admin, are you ready? Okay, we don't hear from the admin, but I think we can take a picture ourselves. Okay. Hi, everybody. Okay.
Okay, so we're in shape group for now together. Just one, two. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, and have a good day. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, Harry, thank you very much. Nice organizations. Oh, it was.